ask them anything. The title, I think, of this section is Ask Temple. So if you have a question about anything to do with welfare, livestock handling, um, anything in that realm, we, we have Temple, and she is available to answer questions. You don't have a slide? No, no slides. Okay. No, I don't have slides enough for questions. No, OK. OK, so step right up and ask some If nobody has a question, I'm going to pick somebody. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. I'd like to first thank you for being an early advocate of animal advocacy in the livestock industry. Uh, four years ago, I heard you talk um, at a Friday evening uh, seminar at the first national seminar of the Coalition of State Horse Councils. At that same meeting, uh, Wyoming Representative Sue Wallace gave an extensive talk about encouraging the consumption of horse meat in the United States and a detailed plan on how we could change our culture to do so. Since Sue Wallace um, died unexpectedly a couple of years ago, I have not heard anything more about the advancement of that culture. Can you tell us anything about it? Well, that potato is so hot, I don't want to touch it. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll only say one thing, and it's on my website, grandon.com, is uh, to do, uh, you know, can horse slaughter be done the humane way, low-stress way? Yes, it can. And it needs four very simple things. Non-slip floor in the kill box. Got to have that. You got to have two people, one person to shoot, the other person to load the box. Because if one person tries to do it, by the time you get the back gate shut and they run around and pick up the rifle, it's throwing a big fit. So you've got to have two people. You've got to have management that cares and supervises. And you can't just take a cattle box and use it because the horse uh, look out over the top onto the slaughter floor, and that's totally bad. Put a, raise the sides on the box. That's all you need to have. It doesn't have to be fancy. Those four things, I've seen it done really well. And I'll just leave it at that. No, because I'd rather uh, work on things like getting students interested in stockmanship and uh, uh, doing things like the discussion you just had about the Bulldog and the Great Pyrenees. There were some very good points there, balanced back and forth, thinking logically about things. But there's some things where this gets so inflammatory that I'm just going to run away from it because go do something else. Something where I can make a difference, like let, just getting people to do good stockmanship. So um, early in your talk, you were talking about how uh, animals have specific memories to where, yes. you know, if it's a person on a horse versus on their, you know, on yes. foot. Yeah. Um, I guess my question would be, if you have an animal that you're working a lot with and exposing them to lots of different situations, for instance, maybe lots of different types of vehicles. Oh, you need to be doing that. Yeah, so then is there a certain point in which they start to generalize? Yes, and not they be will as... start to generalize. Okay. They will start to generalize. You show them enough different things. But you can get into situations where one four-wheeler equals food and three four-wheelers trouble going to get chased. They'll make those kind of differentiations. Yes, they do eventually start to generalize. Okay. But you have to show them on different types of vehicles. Let me tell you about a situation that happened on the movie set. They had a trained show heifer out there, that brown, that reddish-brown heifer. She was uh, fine with every kind of vehicle they had. And every cam piece of camera equipment was just fine. But there's one thing they forgot to train her to, and that was reflector boards. And they had assumed that since a white box truck caused no problems, that a 4 by 8 white styrofoam panel would be fine. But the problem is, a styrofoam panel jerked around by a grip moves totally differently. So we went to take a picture, a PR picture, with the heifer. And I knelt down to let the heifer lick me. Next thing I know, the heifer's rearing to go on top of me, and a grip, people who grip stuff on a movie set are called grips, taking that 4 by 8 white styrofoam sheet and going like that. There's no box truck that does that, that moves suddenly and silently like that. And, and what, then I told him not to move, he moved it again, she started doing it again, by that time I was swearing. <laughs> but that was, a, that was a good example of specific, you see no vehicle moves with that sudden silent motion. At what point do you feel that they get to that point where they're generalizing and not being as fearful about new vehicles in that example? Well, I'd want to try to show them the different classes of vehicles. Four-wheelers, cars, tr trucks, big vehicles, uh, 
uh, the animals that sometimes have the most trouble when they go to town are the ones where they've led too sheltered a life. One old pickup, one person. You also want to get them used to being around other people. If they're going to be in a show, for example, they're going to have strange people touching them. They've got to be able to tolerate that. Uh, there's a point yeah, where it does start to generalize. Okay. But then you see on that movie set, when you look at all the stuff you got on that movie set, but the one thing they forgot to train it to is a reflector board. And it has a very, I mean, it's very lightweight panels. So some of them were four by four silver tinfoil covered styrofoam. You know, and they're flipping it all around like this. And, and you better get them used to those things. Thank you. Because that was a really good, she, I mean, she would have gone on, to, almost did go on top of me. It was not fun. I just have a quick question. Okay. I noticed in the back of your book with the handling facilities with the cattle yes. are all rounded yep. and things. Um, have they done work with horses that haven't been exposed, been... Oh, those same just big curved designs work great with mustangs. Okay, that's what the, I was wondering. I've been the Bureau of Land Management. Yeah, they've already used those drawings. They work fine. Okay, so... Make the, make the sides a bit higher, that's all. It can transfer from cows yeah. to horses that's the trained species. Horses in, in, like Mustangs, moving in groups, a lot of the behaviors are similar, but horses are more flighty. In fact, years ago, I worked with the BLM on handling measurements. Okay, if you're working Mustangs in a chute, you know, I talked about that force field kind of coming out of the chute. Let's say the screen was the side of the chute. If I stayed about here, they'd not rear. But if I just got like here, they'd start to rear. And then if I backed up like this, they'd go back down. So rearing is a very sensitive measure of just starting to invade the flight zone when they're in something where they can't move. But the weird thing is you put a solid top on, you can cover the top of the cardboard. It takes the rear right out of them. You see, that's using behavior. But I can measure a lot of those same things. Rearing, uh, 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 the hitting things, falling down. Uh, on the roundups, I've watched a lot of those videos from the roundups, and Mark, my assistant, went out on one BLP roundup. And if they do the helicopters right, you know, work in the flight zone, that's fine. But I noticed they didn't video and put it on YouTube, put them in the crowds. Because I think they had some crack-ups, and a lot of those crack-ups are caused by not having a crowd that's big enough. So you could run them in there, and there's plenty of room. Because to make a corral that's really big enough, you're going to have to have twice as many panels. And that's a lot of panels to set up. And then those videos just look really nice, and they cut out right at the corrals. And because you get them overcrowded in the corrals, you start having crack-ups. Well, that's stuff you can start measuring. I also worked on handling measurement for bison. Now, I think one thing that's happening with bison, just like I talked about this deer getting kind of domesticated, I think some of the bison aren't as wild as the ones that I can remember the ones from 35 years ago. Oh, man, there was a, you know, a difference. And you get broken horns all the time. Well, now you, if you handle them right, you almost never get a broken horn. But you can measure the same things. You, falling, hitting stuff, balking, rearing. Um, hopefully no electric prods used on them. But you manage the things that you measure. And what the measurement system does is it prevents bad welfare. You see, there's getting to be an emphasis right now on welfare by David Malore from Australia no, New Zealand, excuse me, to look at, does the animal have a positive life? Okay, in my book, Improving Animal Welfare, a Practical Approach for Farm Animals, and there's a bunch of copies on the book table I'd like to sell. Okay, I get asked, let's say I'm going to implement an animal welfare program for farm animals. Okay, what's the first thing I've got to do? The first thing I've got to do is make sure the acts of abuse are stopped so I don't get bad YouTube videos and bad videos put out online. Then the next step would be measuring on uh, measuring animal welfare to prevent problems like lameness. Okay, let's take dairy, for example. Lameness, swollen hocks, skinny cows, dirty cows, bad ammonia levels. I, I've got to, that maintains getting it up to the adequate level. Then you get into behavioral needs, like a nest box for laying hens, for example. Then you can get into uh, what they talk about, positive emotional experiences. Okay, looking at the two dogs there, who has better positive emotional experience. And it was absolutely correct to say, well, how's that bulldog act in that bookstore? Is it happy to see the people or is it, you know, pulling back? That's a big factor in looking at animal welfare literature. Um, some people in the past would say, well, Temple's just um, looking at the negative stuff. 
But if I'm running a supply chain for a major customer, I got to make sure that I got to make sure we don't get those bad videos. So I got to work with that first. And it's sort of like a hierarchy going from preventing abuse up to through acceptable. Both of the dogs are probably definitely high good to um, positive emotional experiences. I'd have to go visit the places to get any idea of which dog I thought had the most positive emotional experiences. And also in my book, I talk about some of the research and cognitive bias tests. Are you looking at the world like positively or negatively? That actually can be tested in animals. Hi, Temple. It's Madonna. <clears throat> Um, I think you'll like this. Sarah, Sarah Eisen and I are working on a project and what we want to evaluate using cameras is uh, body condition score and lameness. So I... And which, what animal are you doing? Uh, so, sows. Oh, the pig. Sows, okay, yeah. Fine. So I'm, I'm thinking about what you said about in the, in the interim measuring balking and stuff because they have to enter a chute because that's where the camera is going to be housed. Any other thoughts that come to your mind on keeping the sows moving easily? Lighting, lighting can be a factor. Now the thing is where the lighting and the distractions make the biggest difference is when they first go in a facility. All right, let's take a dairy for example. I got old experienced cows that you know, you leave a hose on the floor that just walk over it. But you take that new heifer, she's going to come in, stop, put her head down, look at that hose. So especially when the new heifer comes in there, it's more important to get rid of the coat on the fence or the hose on the ground. New heifer's going to stop. And it's very important if you did leave the hose there, give her time, let's say this, give her time to put her head down, take a look, and I have to wait 10, 20 seconds, yeah. and then get her to walk over it. But if you just push her up to that hose on the ground and she freaks out and turns back, you know, you want it gets back to having that good first experience. So make sure that when you first bring the pigs in there that, well, I want to get rid of the distractions, but if you do have a distraction there, give that pig a chance to look at it, you know, the head in the right position. I really like that thing from Ron Gill. It says, down doesn't, this goes, no go. So there, no. Be, there will be about 30 sows on average that walk through this chute. Would you recommend? And, and, well, do you want them to walk through nice, natural walking so I, yeah, you can we measure the lameness so absolutely. electronically? Absolutely, yeah, uh, so we can measure gait. Right? Make sure when you introduce those young pigs to that shoot that's all nice goodness and traits and because if the guilt goes in there and gets a really rotten experience, yeah. she isn't going to walk through there naturally. Yeah. So you take the time. Um, I went to a very interesting seminar about a year and a half ago at the um, Banff uh, Swine Seminar on group housing. And there's some farms doing a really good job with that. And they found that there was three important factors. Pig genetics is definitely a factor. There are certain genetic lines that are not fit to live together. Um, don't put too many sows on one of those feeders, those electronic feeders, probably about 45 sows per feeder, that's it. Yeah. And then they talked about having their pig whisperer, somebody that um, really would take the time to train the young gilts. And it had to be kind of a special person kind of really laid back. It was the guy who was always late for work or would do it in the middle of the night. And they'd give him a certain amount of sows to train and that person's really important because if those young pigs have a bad experience with that electronic feeder, they're not going to go back in there again. Yeah. So take okay. the time with your young pigs to train them and be gentle with them, especially when you first introduce this apparatus. And then they're going to walk through it normally for you. Hi. Um, I had a question about um, dairy cows, about okay. keeping their lives positive and um, keeping their welfare in mind, specifically about the separation of calf and mother. Well, that's question. I'm getting that, the question separating the calf from the mom. I'm getting that question more just in the last three or four years from people. Now, let's look at the, the adult cows. Big, soft, comfy beds. There's a couple of papers right now in dairy science about that. They've got to have a nice place to lie that's soft. That's really, really important for indoor dairy cows. Uh, about all I can tell them is when I was 15, my boarding school had a 12-cow dairy. That was back in the early 60s. And they were taking the calves away. You know, this is not some new fa factory farm thing. Mm -hmm. And that's about all I can I tell them. And I also say that the... Um, 
Uh, the Holstein, you know, she doesn't like it when you take her calf away, but the Angus cow's going to protest more. Mm -hmm. I think there's a breed differences and, and that instinct to protect the calf, uh, but a, that is an issue. But all I could say is they've been doing it forever, and it's not some big industrial thing. It's not new. And that's how I've answered it. Yeah. I don't know if that's an adequate answer, but... Yeah. And that question seems to be coming up more and more. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, I wondered how you feel about the argument um, in raising chickens in a cage environment where they might be uh, susceptible. Now, what kind of chickens? Broilers, layers? Um, I guess I was thinking layers. Um, in, a, in a cage environment where they may be more susceptible to uh, things like foot lesions or bone problems versus a group environment where maybe they're picking on each other more. Well, um, picking each other more and get more cute fractures because they crash yeah. and land and they try to fly. Uh, you know, right here at this university, you need to talk to Janice Swanson. She was on the McDonald's um, the Sustainable Egg Coalition, and they looked at conventional battery cages, stocked at the, um, e the uh, egg producer's uh, recommended stocking density. They looked at an enriched cage, which gives them several amenities. Full walking height. You know how birds walk like this? Mm -hmm. in, in that, they can actually walk normally, perches, private nest box, the bird has a strong instinct to hide when it lays its egg and a little scratch place. And then they looked at an aviary, open aviary type system. And the research showed that the enriched cage, which is like an apartment living for chickens with some amenities, uh, and the traditional battery cage, they did about the same. And the aviary had dirty eggs, dirty air, and a very high death loss. Yeah. So then McDonald's new CEO decided to go cage free. And uh, the science didn't, wasn't recommending that at the time. And we were called the day before the press release went out. And then uh, a few months later, I opened up a brand new Fortune. And it's called, there's an article called Free Bird, Fortune Magazine, which I read real carefully, Her Brooks Egg Firm. Mm -hmm. And they've, what they've done is made a cage free that's actually sort of like uh, enriched cages without the doors. Mm -hmm. So the birds can decide what deck they want to live on. And they can fly between the. Uh, the, the different uh, platforms, you know, layers in this thing. And they've um, solved the dirty air problem and the death loss was greatly reduced. Mm. Now it's still an intensive system and they're not an open aviary. Yeah. But when you think about it, chickens don't live in huge flocks in nature. Right. The yeah. other interesting thing on the pecking is some research has shown this displaced foraging behavior. Because when you videotape it at high speed, they peck with the same motion they used to peck the ground. The problem is when they forage in the other bird's feathers, the results are disastrous. And there are genetic differences in that pecking behavior. Uh, as a well-known educator and advocator of animal agriculture and welfare, um, I think it's obvious that we see a lot of times at Michigan State University, a land grant institution, agricultural um, facilities and things that, like that. What is your involvement um, in the education and advocating of these issues in the general public society? I've done a lot of talks to, at universities. And uh, one of the problems we have today is we've got young people growing up today who are totally removed from the world of the practice. And they'll say things to me like, oh, can you make a slaughterhouse perfect? No, I can't make it perfect. I can make it really good, but I can't make it perfect. And you've got, you know, they've never cooked, sewed, done woodworking, make stuff. They haven't done stuff. And I can remember wrecking a sewing project when I was a kid because I cut the fabric too quickly. Sometimes things go wrong in the practical world. And they sort of just don't understand that. It, it's... Uh, one of the worst things the schools have done is taken the hands-on classes out, and they're now getting into some of my other talks I do. And I just explain things. Um, and the, there's some of the research shows that students that visit farms usually have a better um, uh, attitude. I think Fair Oaks Farm outside of Chicago is doing a great job, showing a great big dairy. They've got pig adventure for a big pig farm, and they're going to have a cage-free uh, layer operation, too, that they're going to open to the public. So I'm really glad that you used the word practical, because um, I was kind of afraid of using that word. Um, but I agree that a lot of times it's you know missing what's practical and how we've always done things. Well, there's <sighs> things that need to be changed. 
And I, I, when I first started, handling was atrocious. And handling is one of the things that has greatly improved. You know, that, that's some of the good news, at least in the, the big feed yards. Uh, the Cassandra's survey showed some of there's some ranchers that are still doing too much hot shot, but the, uh, the big feed yards, see, it gets, management's got to get behind fixing stuff. You know, when I first uh, started, I thought we could fix everything with engineering. Engineering's half, the other half is management. Man top management's got to care. And they've got to get out of the office and get out in the field and actually see what's going on. How would you go about, or how would you suggest for all of us to go about um, drawing that fine line between animal rights and animal welfare? Well, I think it gets down to I, see, I eat all the animal proteins, I eat the dairy products. Uh, there, some, see, it gets into do I want to reform and fix an industry or get rid of it? I use all the animal products. I, pl I plan to keep eating all the animal products. I want to work on improving the industry. You know, if, if someone's goal is to get rid of the industry, those people don't like me. I've had some of those people write some extremely nasty things about me. Like they wanted to take an electric prod and apply it to my anatomy in a way that's not repeatable. <laughs> the things written online are absolutely shareable. Uh, then you get into a common consumer concern that big is bad. That's a very common thing that comes up in a lot of surveys. Well, I don't know how you can feed everybody. I don't care if it's crops or it's um, uh, animals. You've you got to have a certain level of economy of scale. But I think there's some things that big ag can learn from little ag. Big ag's going to have to start doing a lot more crop rotation. That's already starting to happen. Um, there's things that are being learned. And they're both ag. I work with, try to work with everybody. They need to stop throwing rocks at each other. And there's some stuff that has to be changed. I mean, sow gestation stalls. That's one of the things that's got to change. There's some stuff that has to be changed. I think we have to look at everything that we do and go, if I brought 10 people in from the Minneapolis airport or whatever, or Detroit airport, how would they react to it? I've taken a lot of people out to slaughterhouses, and they kind of go, oh, it's nowhere bad as I thought it was going to be. And I've got videos, beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin, pork plant video tour, turkey plant video tour, and lamb plant video tour that just shows how the things work. I, when we get the, what Fair Oaks has done is great. Great big, huge, gigantic dairy. And it's, um, they get to see how everything works. And it was interesting taking high-level executives out of the office uh, for the first time, seeing their first slaughter plants and large farms. And when things were decent, oh, that's not bad. But when something was bad, I, they were true undercover boss moments. And I witnessed those undercover boss moments, like, oh, there's some things here we have to really change. Especially on the condition of old animals. That's an area where there's still quite a lot of problems. People bringing in old breeding stock that have been allowed to deteriorate too far. Thank you. I have two questions related to the um, packing plants. Okay. And um, during the presentation, you talked about the BQA, the Beef Quality Beef Assurance. Beef Quality Assurance, yes. So I'm wondering if you can explain how much of the changes at packing plants are driven by the industry and how much of them are driven by regulatory changes. Well, I'll tell you what drove the change. It was the power of the golden arches. I've been in this industry now for over 40 years. And I put really nice equipment into packing plants. Half my clients tore it up and wrecked it. And the thing that kept me going is I had a few clients that were good. So that was sort of like I knew it could be fixed. But I had other clients where we used to sit in the maintenance shop and talk about the ability to wreck the sprockets on the center track restrainer and they never, all the busted hydraulics and stuff. And, and I developed a very simple scoring system. We scored five things. Stunning score, had to be 95% for the bang one shot, immediately shoot with the second shot, everything dead on the rail. 3% vocalization in the restrainer, in the stun box, 1% falling anywhere in the facility, unloading the trucks, and no more than 25% of the animals could get the electric prodder put on them. They had to make those numbers, plus no acts of abuse. And we'd go in a plant, uh, and they'd fail it. And I just got back to the office, and I said, I am doing reverse conflict of interest. You know I, I make equipment. We're going to make whatever you've got here work. And I just said, reverse conflict of interest. I said it right up front. Because I couldn't recuse myself from it. I had to do it. 
So I found out of 75 original suppliers, pork and beef, only three had to build something expensive, and we let those slide for a while. Nods the flooring and unloading ramp, stun box floors, metal rods, then a little later on rubber mats. Lighting, adding lights, moving lights to get rid of reflections, training, solid sides put in just the right place. We made some shabby old plants work. I was almost amazed how well we got some of the older plants to work. But when a big company came in, uh, you can really make change, but the scoring was very simple. I didn't tell them how to build a plant. They had to make their numbers. And if they were rich, religious slaughter, no hanging up by the angles. They had to use a shoot. That was one of the banned things. And then Wendy's came in with a real good program six months later, kept it on the same scoring, the same traffic rules. Simple. Very, very, very simple. It worked. The plants knew exactly what they had to do. And I, I wasn't in there trying to sell equipment or anything. I was up front. I bent over a backwards to make their piece of junk work. My follow -up we had question. two that didn't eventually. But. So my follow-up question on that is, um, you talked about carcass characteristics being able to be changed in the last five minutes of handling at the plant. And so I wonder how the, peop how the plants get that information. Well, a plant, um, uh, there was some studies if hot electric prods all over animals in the last five minutes going up that chute is going to cause tough meat and beef. That's Robin Warner's research. And pale, soft, watery meat and pigs. You've got pigs screeching and backing up and stopping and jamming. Uh, the lactate levels go up. There are some people right now measuring lactates with a lactate scout meter to, to measure the quality of handling in their chutes. Now, a lot of the big pork plants now are putting in the CO2 machines where they're handled in a group. And that makes it possible to totally get rid of all of the electric prods. And, and that improves the handling a whole lot. Uh, if you set up your cattle system right, they move well in, in single file. But details matter. I was just at a, we were just doing some training in a plant just recently, and somebody turned the fan to blow back on the guy driving the cattle in the restrainer, and the cattle got the air blowing on them, and they wouldn't go in. Just because a fan that someone could turn like that, someone had moved it. And all of a sudden, the system went from working perfectly to working horrible. You see, the distractions matter a whole lot. If you've got animals that won't go in, up a chute, you've got to look in there and see what's wrong. The first thing you look at is airflow back at them, and then I'm going to look for stuff they're seeing, moving reflections, seeing people walk by, pieces of shiny metal jiggling. It can be a whole lot of things. Change the light on the ceiling, reflection goes away, they go in. I sometimes can't believe how well it works. I've gone into plants and I do what I call lights and cardboard. Stick up the cardboard in the right place, add a light, move a light, and then it works. There was no conflict of interest with a lamp company. Thank you. I've got lots of papers published on this. You can look them up on Google Scholar on the slaughterhouse stuff. Hi, ma'am. Um, what would you recommend uh, for trying to ear tag Texas longhorn cattle that are brought to uh, a sale at a temporary facility? Yep, and you don't have the right head gate, the right chute to bring them up. Yeah, it can be a real problem. And there's special chutes you can get for longhorns. Okay. Uh, that's a real problem if you've got to ear tag them, unless you've got something to hold them, put them in. How many longhorns are you getting here? <laughs> um, maybe several hundred. Well, somebody needs to get, put some facilities in. They're getting that many of them, and there's special wide squeeze chutes for longhorns, and and uh, the regular. Some of the ones with the shorter horns can learn to turn the head. Again, if you took the calves when they were young, they can learn to turn the head and go down the chute. But if you just bring them up there, ramming them in there, then they're going to get so scared that you're not going to get them in there. Yeah, that's the concern. Thank you. No, it's a it's a concern. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be around the rest of the day, so I'd um, be happy to talk to people out, you know, all during lunch and other times. I need the microphone. Okay. Okay, we need the microphone. All righty.